be in Romans chapter 12 today. I'm going to be reading it from the message translation, which is a modern day translation. So it's, it's, it's interpreted or translated out of the Greek, uh, kind of the way that you and I would talk. So you'd see phrase that, phrases that we would use. Uh, it's not the same translation that Jesus used. Of course, all of us know that, that Jesus, when he read the Bible, used the King James translation. Uh, in 1611 uh, was when it was translated. So for those of you that are halfway awake, you know that's a joke. Uh, but I grew up with the, with the King James Bible. And so today I want to talk about where we were last week, and I want to build on that, and the idea of being grateful. You know, as we move towards this Thanksgiving season, uh, I want to try to build in us a little deeper sense of, of gratitude. Uh, so today I want to talk about deep gratitude because that's a phrase that jumps out of this passage that Paul uses in the book of Romans chapter 12. And so before I, before I get there, uh, I, I, just want to, I just want to say this. I just want to say how grateful I am for all of you. Um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't ever think for sure that I would ever get to do this, so you should know that. And, and I didn't step into full-time ministry. I did a lot of bivocational part-time ministry all through the years, all of my life pretty much, uh, but until I, until I got here. But you guys as a congregation, you're loving, you're supportive, you're thoughtful, very willing to get involved and be a part of things. Most of the time, the staff doesn't even have to initiate something when someone needs to be cared for or ministry done. The idea comes from just organically from out of this church family. So I just appreciate you so much uh, for what you do and what you're a part of. And, uh, and I, just, I just counted a privilege to be serving as your pastor. So I, that's a part of my heart right now that, that's grateful. So I want to talk today out, out of this passage. So let's read. It's Romans chapter 12, parts of the first three verses. From, again, from the message translation. Look how Paul phrases this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, and going to work, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the inside out. Now here's the phrase. And I'm speaking to you, Paul says, out of a deep gratitude for all that God has given me. Okay, so I want us to take these passages for a few moments and just talk about what it means to be grateful, how to develop that. So the question is, how do we get to the place where we can say what the Apostle Paul says? My, my approach to things, the way in which I'm talking to you, comes out of a deep sense of gratitude. This is not casual gratitude. This is not, hey, happy Thanksgiving. Let's go to Hobby Lobby and buy another decoration, right? This is, this is Paul saying, in the depth of my soul, I want you to know I'm so grateful for you and for what God has done in my life. Because we do live in a world, don't we, full of grumpy negative people. If you are among them, I apologize now for stepping on your toes, but what I want you to know is I'm really aiming at your heart. So listen, we, we live in a world full of people who are dissatisfied, who grun, you know, grumble about stuff all the time, and, and they, they raise a chorus. They sing every part. It's soprano, alto, tenor, bass. They sing every part of a chorus that just looks at every part of life, and they're unhappy. If it's raining, they're mad because it's raining. If it's not raining, they're upset because it's too dry. You know some of those people? When I taught school, I identified who those people were very quickly on every campus I taught in. And on and I made it a point that if one of those people who sang the grumble, grumpy, everything's negative song happened to be in the teacher's lounge when I went in there to get coffee, I got the coffee and left. I didn't stay. Uh, an older teacher advised me, said, sometimes the worst place you can be during a teaching day is in the teacher's lounge. So listen, we want to be a people who have a certain way of going. So here's what I think Paul's saying to us. I think he's saying when he says... Take your everyday ordinary life. Don't you love it? You're sleeping. How many of you think sleeping is sacred? You're sleeping. You're eating. You're going to work. Your everyday things. 
And here's what I think he's saying. That we should view everyday life as sacred. We should view everyday life as sacred. I think a person who adopts this perspective that Paul is trying to describe to us is a person who lives with a deep sense of gratitude because they have learned to operate their lives from a different sort of posture. The way that they approach their paradigm, their viewpoint, their worldview comes out of a different way of viewing things. And they refuse to be negative. They refuse to be bitter and angry. They are going to find some way, even in the worst situation, to be the one person in the room who is grateful. And Paul says that we should be people like that. We should keep our hearts in a certain position. And one of the ways he says we should do it is we should fix our attention on God. But your everyday life, your everyday life is not separate from your spiritual life. It is your spiritual life. Right? I don't know where, you know, you can read some of this history, and I I know a little bit about this. But the idea of secular, which means things that aren't religious or holy or sacred, your secular life, like mowing your lawn or paying your taxes, is somehow separate from your holy life. You know, things like having a quiet time, having communion, reading your Bible, going to worship. Somehow, we, 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 you know, somewhere along the way, we, we divided those. But Paul, notice, he doesn't make any division. He, he brings them together. He said, you're, you should take your everyday life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, changing diapers, mowing the lawn, doing the dishes, paying the bills... Being a good husband, being a good wife, being a good daughter. being a, I mean, your everyday stuff that you're doing, and you should place it before God because it's all holy. There's really no, in Scripture, no sacred and secular division. It's all a part of who we are. I love this quote. The secular is only that way because it hasn't yet discovered that it too is holy. See? Madeline Lingle, who I know she wrote the book Wrinkle in Time and some other works, some works that I studied when I was in college getting a minor in English. But I love her quote about this. She says, There is nothing so secular that it cannot be sacred. And that is one of the deepest messages of the Incarnation. It, so you think about Jesus. I mean, you just got to... I mean, I just... I, I think the older I get, the more I fall in love with this, with this idea. And the Word became flesh. And He dwelt among us. He stepped out of heaven on dirty, nasty, filthy earth, among negativity and hatred, and He walked among us, redeeming mankind with every step and those dirty sandals that needed to be washed. I mean, Jesus stepped out of heaven, right? And He lived among us. In 1 John it says, says, the the Word that we declare to you, we declare to you the Word that we've seen with our eyes and we've handled with our own hands. It was John's way of saying, I am not talking to you about theory. I'm talking to you about the Word of life, the Messiah, the incarnate One, Emmanuel, God with us. I've handled Him. I touched Him. I sat by Him at the Last Supper. I know what He was like. This is what I declare to you. And what, where was Jesus? Sitting at tables eating meals, going into the market, talking to prostitutes, talking to tax collectors. Zacchaeus, what are you doing up in that tree? Come on, man. I want to go to your house and eat. How about that day? You think Zacchaeus on that day thought that what they were eating at dinner was sacred and holy? Sure it was. But what he didn't needed to realize was all of it is sacred and holy. Don't you love that the last two weeks I've been talking a lot about food? This weekend, I went to the Turtle and sat out on the back patio on a very nice evening. Had a drink. I won't tell you what it was, but it was good. And I had, I looked at the menu, and my nephew's the, the waiter, one of the waiters there, so he was my waiter. And I said, I said, Drex, I said, I can't tell if that's beef or pork, because it was, it was described as the, the porterhouse something something. And it was this massive pork chop that was like that thick. And I was thinking about the words of the things I said last week, you know, in Ecclesiastes. What did he say? Out of everything I've looked at, I've, I've looked at all of life. And at the end of all of life, examining it from the wisest position, having been given a special gift of wisdom, I've decided this, that there's nothing better to do under the sun than to enjoy the food, enjoy drink, and find some kind of satisfaction in your work. Come on. We make it too complicated. What what, what is spiritual? It's all spiritual. Your tennis shoes are spiritual. When your kid vomits on you, it's spiritual. 
It's, I mean, it's life, right? It's like, it, it, is, it is life, right? And so Madeline was right that, that the secular is only that way because it hasn't understood the deepest meaning of the incarnation that all things are holy. So, this week I, I did that. And by the way, I, I wasn't done with my culinary tour last night for the first time. I went to, uh, while and Carolyn were there, went to the, and Scott and his wife, Amanda, went to the Spirit of Texas winery out in Zephyr and got, had a panini that was to die for and, some, and, a, and a, a few glasses of wine. A few. And uh, it was good wine, wasn't it, Scott? Yeah, see, Scott shared his bottle. I shared my bottle. Listen, is it okay if we say that in church? Listen, there's nothing better to do under the sun than to enjoy your food, enjoy your drink, and find satisfaction in your work. It's scriptural. And Paul is saying today, take your everyday life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and present it before God. It's when you start the day, you're like, God, I don't know what today is going to bring. But today i got to be around Debbie. And everybody hates Debbie. Today I have to do that one thing in my job I hate every month. God, help me give it to you. God, I pray for Debbie somehow. God, do a miracle. Help Debbie be okay today. Right? I mean, everyday life. God, as I drive, as I eat, as I clock in, as I fax, as I email, as I do my paperwork, as I go get coffee, as I feed my kids, as I vacuum my house. Present it all before God because it's all holy. It's all sacred. And then this. It's interesting that in this passage, I want to read this. But here's the point. Meaning is found in connection. What connection is Paul talking about? Here's the second passage. It won't be on the screen, but here it is. Paul says this. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what He does for us. You want to accurately understand yourself? Understand yourself in connection to God. That's how you're going to understand yourself. And it's not what we are and what we do for Him. And then this. For we are like the various parts of a human body, for each part gets its meaning. Check this out. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole. And the body that we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. That's you. Each of us finds our meaning. There's meaning again. Each of us finds our meaning and our function as a part of His body. And then I love, here's the modern day language. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? I got my foot caught in a lawnmower one time. And while I was trying to, I was by myself out in the country, nobody else around. And as I was struggling to get my wits, I pulled my shoe off and there was blood filling my sock. And I had visions of chopped off toes. This, is, this scripture is hard for me to read. It's kind of traumatic. It was just wounded. And, but, and thankfully, I still have my foot and my toes. So as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much. So since we find ourselves fashioned into these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, love this, let's just go ahead and be who we were made to be. You may think, you, you, might, you might, maybe this has crossed your mind, I don't know if you think this far, but you might think, that the best part of my week is doing this right now. And I love doing this. I'm passionate about this. I felt called to this a long time ago before anybody said it and put it on paper. Okay? I like preaching and teaching. I consider it very important. I listen to preachers and teachers of all kinds all the time. It, it fascinates me still to this day. Okay? But let me tell you something. My favorite part, my favorite part of being in church life is when I see someone else find their place in the body of Christ. That's when I get excited. So when somebody kind of goes, you know, I've been kind of tinkering with this for a long time, and I've never taught Sunday school, but I think I could do it. You think I could try a class? And then they get in there and they kill it. That's when I get excited. Or somebody that says, you know, I'll never preach, I'll never sing, I'll never teach a class, but you know what I'm really good? I'm really good at auto mechanics. And here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to start a ministry called Gearhead Ministries. And once a month, we're going to invite everybody in the church to bring their car if they're having trouble with their car, especially single moms and the elderly. And we'll change their oil for free. And we'll do a tune-up. And we'll do anything else it needs to do to keep their car going. My friend Junior Cortoy did exactly that. Wasn't gonna, Junior wasn't going to preach. If you knew Junior, you would laugh. You would know that he was not going to preach. Junior wasn't going to do 
all this other spiritual stuff at the church, but he could turn a wrench. And he got a group of guys and he said, listen, we're going to start this thing called Gearhead Ministries. You bring your bag of tools once a month and we're going to help a bunch of people. Do you think single moms struggling to pay the bills whose car was breaking down and barely running, you think they didn't think it was spiritual when Junior got under their hood and fixed their car? I was in this uh, class one time at a church in San Antonio. It was a big church called uh, Eagle's Nest uh, in North San Antonio. It's now, today, it's called The Summit. It's a large church. It's like, half the size of Brownwood kind of church. And when I was there, it was about maybe 700 to 1,000 people, and it was growing. And they announced one day, I was a young husband. I was you know, starting to make a little bit of money as a teacher. I emphasize a little bit. And uh, so I was a young teacher, and they announced they were going to have this financial planning class, a class to help you learn how to really manage your finances and maximize your tax credits and blah, blah, blah. You know, And I'm like, that would be a good class for me to go to. So I go to the class. The guy that was teaching it was Wayne Gordon, Dr. Wayne Gordon, military trained, and he was a neurologist. And he was very, very wealthy. I went to his home a couple of times. Nice house. A couple of nice cars. He didn't drive Fords and Chevys. He drove Mercedes. And all of them were paid for the day he drove them off the lot. That was one thing he shared in the class. He said, I haven't bought a car since I was about 25 that I didn't write the check for. it. I've never paid interest. So all this kind of stuff. There's this guy helping him with it, and I'd never met this guy. And the reason I'd never met this guy was because he didn't preach and didn't sing. But he was so excited to be a part of the class. He was a CPA, financial planner by trade. And here's what he said one night. He got up to share. He and Wayne took turns teaching parts. He got up to share this one part. He said, I want to begin by saying this. I'm so excited to be a part of this class. And I promise you, if you'll pay attention, we're going to teach you some things that will make a difference in your finances. He said, but here's why I'm excited about teaching this class. Because I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to teach. And God knows I'll never sing. He said, but when I heard Wayne wanted to do this, I said to myself, I can do that. I can do that. And he went to Wayne and said, let me help you. Let me, let me give you some of my years of experience. Listen, you know what you need to be doing? Looking around for the place where you will go, I can do that. That's what you need to be looking for. And if we're not doing it yet, come to us and say, listen, I have this idea. This is the thing I know I can do, and I'll get a few other people, and we'll start a new ministry. Let me do the thing that I'm created to be. Because what did Paul say? Just go ahead and be what you were made to be. Go ahead. Have, have, have a purpose on me. Just go for it. And just do what you're called to do. I echo the sentiment. Listen, there's an admonition here to understand yourself in relationship to God and how you fit in the body of Christ and for you to be who you are. I don't ever want in the church life to be guilty of trying to get people to fit into some ministry area that's not who they are just so I can check a box on some ministry quota system. Are you with me? I want people to be who they are. There's a quote that Nanda loved from a book called Wild at Heart. It's called Discovering the Secret of a Man's Soul. This quote could be Discovering the Secret of a Woman's Soul, too. It could be both. And this, the book is about men. It's a great book, I, and I'll tell you honestly, it changed my life. If you haven't read it, you should go read it, guys. Gals, too. Because every, every mom that's raising a boy should read that book. Because it just talks about masculinity in a way that our culture kind of misses. But here's the quote Nanda loved. Okay. I'll make sure I get it right. I'm going to try to start it wrong here if I don't look at my notes. The quote is this. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Instead, find out what makes you come alive and do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. That's what I'm trying to describe to you today. Listen, don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to do somebody else's ministry or you know, try to square peg in the round hole, you know, whatever. I get so frustrated with Christianity that we've got to categorize things. I mean, there's, there's room for creativity. The God's people ought to be the most forward-thinking, creative people on the planet. Amen? We ought to be. We ought, I mean, we have the mind of Christ. We ought to be those people. We ought to be going, you know, we're doing all these good things with the youth and the kids and worship, and we have three different services, and we're doing turkey takeout, and we're doing, you know, just blah, 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 blah. And somebody ought to be going, you know what we ought to be doing, though? This thing makes me come alive. Now listen, I'm like that. I don't know about you. 
I can't stand to be around people who are doing what they're doing only because it makes a paycheck. Maybe there's a time to do that, and I've done that too. But I'm saying, I want to be around people that when they talk to me, they just come alive. And I'm like, I like this guy. I like this guy. I want to be with them. I want to be on their team. You know what I mean? So a few weeks ago, we were, I was moving, right? So we're packing up my house. I'm pretty tired. I have an old pickup truck. It's an O2 Chevy Silverado. It'll run forever. The air still works. Some of the other parts are not working. Uh, but the air conditioner's still good. Went out to start it. And, you know, as things would go, when I'm busy, got a million things to do, I go out, and, of course, it won't start. Try to jump it off. It won't jump off. I'm like, I don't have time to wait around. Somebody have to work to help me with this. I got friends that know cars. but So I call. Guy comes an hour or two later, tow truck. I'm thinking, I'm going to have to tow it. Maybe it's the alternator. And really nice guy gets out of the truck. He says, no, no, man, he's not, I can get it going. He's, he's got one of those, I don't know what you call it, but it's like a, it's a battery supercharger, right? It charges it real fast. Is there a name for it? A jump box? Okay, so he gets out the jump box. In fact, he has to try two different ones. It's pretty dead. He tries the first one, he goes, ah, it's not enough. Gets another one, it's got more power or something. So he gets the jump box going. And while we're standing there, he goes, it'll take a few minutes. He said, give it 15 minutes and then we'll get it going. He said, it's pretty dead. We're standing there talking and somewhere in the middle of it, he asked me a question, and I said, well, for whatever reason, I said, my tailgate's jammed. It won't open. And he says, well, why is it jammed? I said, because I ran into the church with my truck. Which is true, right back here. Mike and I were building these things. So that was a year and a half, two years ago, whatever it was. And I had the tailgate down, right? And I was backing up, and this part of the building goes out like that, and I couldn't quite see because the back of my truck was full of stuff, and I hit it good enough that it, it, it bent my tailgate, and like a dummy, I shut it. So this guy looks at, you know, it's been broken for two years, and I just hadn't fixed it. I don't drive my truck that much. So you know what he does? He comes alive. He, he looks at it, he goes, oh, I think I, he goes, I, I see what the problem is here. I can fix that. Now he's not supposed to be fixing my tailgate. He's just there to jump my car off, right? He goes over, grabs out a few tools. He says, come here, hold this right here. And he kind of hits on something, gets the tailgate open, takes this one part off that's bent. He says, here, take that to the, the body shop or, you know, scrap yard, get a new one of these, put that on, you'll be fine, and da-da-da-da-da. And, and I'm like, I mean, for him, it wasn't extra work. It wasn't like, oh, darn, it's Dummy can't fix his tailgate. Now i got to fix it. And Lord, he ran into the church of his truck. It, he just fixed it. And you could tell he's just like got a kick out of it. And then he was explaining to me mechanically why it was broken and what else had to be done to fix it. Like it was just like in his head. And, you know, being a guy who is not mechanically naturally inclined, uh, I was kind of amazed by that. So listen, there are going to be times in your life when people are going to come to you for a jump. It's part of what we do for each other, right? Anybody here have a best friend that when you're having a really bad day, you call him or call her? I got my buddy Alan. I'm like, dude, I'm swimming upstream. You got to help me out here. He gives me a jump. But in the middle of being given the jump, we want people who can do other things too and come alive and say, look, I can fix that. and We'll fix that. But here's this other thing that I can do for you. Listen. What, what, what is it? Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And because, why, why is that true? Because what the world needs, what the world needs is men and women who have come alive to their purpose. I want to ask the worship team to come as we prepare to sing. And I want you to remember that eating and drinking is sacred. That changing diapers is sacred. That mowing lawns and doing the dishes and vacuuming and, and God, even painting, I guess, is sacred. Right? All these things that we can do. That, that we are to be the people. We are to be the ones in the room that are more alive because we've done what? We've taken our everyday, ordinary life and done what? We've laid it before God. And we're like, God, today I'm going to go punch the clock. I'm going to get the oil change. I'm going to do this. God, will You come and bless it? Will you, Will you touch it? Because if you don't touch it, it's not going to be what it's supposed to be. God, will you come and just touch my life? I just surrender myself for you, before you at the beginning of this day. And I ask for your blessing. 
on what I do today, that you would be with me, O Lord. I hope that in our minds that we would not allow the method of communion to diminish what it means to us in our hearts. That a Savior became flesh and dwelt among us. That a Savior went to a cross. He rose on the third day. But before He did, He met with His men. And He took a cup. Now where did He get that wine? Did He have it imported from another country? Did He have somebody go to Egypt and get the best wine? They had eaten this Passover meal before different places each year. He just took the common everyday table wine. Here's that common thing again. Your everyday ordinary life. He took ordinary wine and He said, guys, this is the blood of the new covenant. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And then the same thing. He didn't didn't hire somebody to go to a five-star restaurant in Jerusalem and bring the finest breads from the greatest chefs in the land, what did he do? He just took the bread that was already there before him and he stood up and he broke that bread and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This is given for forgiveness of many. And that's how he instituted communion. So we here today, as we take our cups, as we remember what he's done for us to, to redeem our lives so that we can be what? we can really become all of who we are in the body of Christ. And through that connection, live in a sense of fullness. We thank the Lord today for His body and His blood.